Yes. Members, before I open the debate, I received a letter from one Honorable Wandeto purporting to withdraw his signature. I want to invite the Honorable Member to read the standing orders that are very clear. Once you append your signature to a special motion, <laughs> once you append your signature on a special motion, you have crossed the Rubicon and you cannot withdraw that signature. Honorable Otienda Molo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, sh shall I use the dispatch with your permission? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this special motion is unprecedented but contemplated by the Constitution, and I support it. Let it be a lesson, Mr. Speaker, that be you ever so high, the Constitution is still above you. Mr. Speaker, some have told me and have told us that this is not our war. But, Mr. Speaker, they do not know that in circumstances of combat, a bystander is at greater risk than a combatant. You must choose your sides. And I've chosen, Mr. Speaker, after listening to the display of jingoism by the Deputy President, after listening to the self-entitlement for two and a half hours, after listening to the disdain of governance institutions, this parliament and the courts, after listening to the DP threatening that parliament and the courts should know that you it's not easy to remove a deputy president who had 7.2 million votes. Mr. Speaker, after treating Kenyans as fools by trying to mislead on the intent and purpose of his utterances on the idea of government being a company, it was easy for me to make a decision to cast my lot with impeachment of the deputy president. Mr. Speaker, there can be much to say on the reasons. It is easy for example, Mr. Speaker, to talk about the confessions of the Deputy President regarding 600 million that his son under 30 years was able to acquire. And he says, without tabling any evidence, that it was acquired from a bank. But he admits, Mr. Speaker, more importantly, two things. One, that the property in issue was government property, irregularly acquired without the usual procurement processes. He also admits, Mr. Speaker, that the son was able to be given, you know, a moratorium of one year not to pay anything while enjoying the proceeds. And the DP thinks there's nothing wrong with that. It is for good reason that the anti-corruption laws in this country do not limit themselves to the individual. They go to the spouse and the children. It is for such reasons. Mr. Speaker, it is also interesting that the DP admits to abuse of office. How does he do that? The DP admits to abuse of office on the issue of KEMSA. It is important, and this bears repetition, that the evidence tabled by the Honorable Mutuse includes an affidavit by Dr. Mulwa. That affidavit at paragraph 5 is very instructive, and it says that the DP's phone calls was aimed at interfering and covering procurement irregularities. And that is on a direct affidavit. But more importantly, if you look at page 69, you will see the SMSs. And that SMS, the son of the deputy president, Dr. Ikinu Rigadi, has the courage to say that there is a document for his excellency we are trying to collect, not for himself, not for any other company, for his excellency. And the fact, Mr. Speaker, that the DP admits to these processes and sees nothing wrong with it 
is a very serious matter of integrity. But Mr. Speaker, I'll not speak to all those two. I'll speak to a more fundamental fact. The blatant justification of discrimination and insightful utterances against Kenyans. That is where I want to focus, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in this, the DP and their have gone through the documents, there are various clips where the DP repeats this, that Kenya is a company and those who did not vote for Kenya Kwanzaa are not entitled to enjoy the proceeds from that company. What worries me, Mr. Speaker, is that with a straight face, the DP could appear on live television and justify these utterances. How does he justify it? He says that he is entitled to do that because there are some partisan political agreements or promises that were made. What does that mean? The DP elevates promises at a political party level above the National Cohesion and Integration Act, Section 13. He elevates those promises at a political party level above the Constitution of Kenya. There are 15 different articles that speaks against this. The fact that the DP can think that he can justify such utterances and elevate these agreements above the law and the constitution is the clearest evidence that he must go because he has breached the constitution. <laughs> it is important to note that Article 145, 1A and C do not say that if you are respecting a political promise, then you can breach the constitution. If that was to be the case, Article 24 would include that as a, as a limitation. It does not include. If you want one reason members to impeach the, uh, the deputy president is because he has admitted to breaching the constitution on account of a political promise. Mr. Speaker, Article 145.1b is another interesting one. And it speaks to reasonable, a serious reasons to believe that the DP has breached the Constitution. You do not need the hard evidence. Members, remember, for conviction, that is for courts. We are not a court of law. Ours is to look at the evidence and see if there's a serious and reasons to believe. Those serious reasons speak to integrity. They speak to impropriety. And if you look at them and then find that there's some impropriety, then ground seven will have been proved. Ground seven talks of the issue of acquired property coming to 5.2 billion. What struck me, Mr. Speaker, is that the deputy president took one and a half hours to explain why he's not corrupt. Of the two and a half hours, 90 minutes was to explain why he is not corrupt. The very fact that you take 90 minutes to explain you are not corrupt is prima facie evidence of corruption. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, for one who is not corrupt, you can explain it in a sentence, period. To take 90 minutes is in itself prima facie evidence that there's corruption. Mr. Speaker, on the KEMSA issue, other than their feed of it and their interference, their, their feed of it, the, the DP then admits interference. Whoever advised the DP to do that live interview could not have had his interest at heart, but has made our work much the easier. Because now there are self-incriminations, confessions, and admissions that we can work with. Mr. Speaker, it is clear from yesterday's presentation that the deputy president can no longer deputize the president. The role of any deputy under the constitution is to deputize. Mr. Speaker, I came for just two more minutes. <laughs> so that, Mr. Speaker, even the fact, Mr. Speaker, it is not a ground of the impeachment by Honorable Mwangi Mutuse. But it has become a clear ground from yesterday's interview that the DP is incapable of deputizing the president. And if we needed an independent ground, that is very clear. It is also clear that the DP can no longer be part of a cabinet. It is a 
basic rule in terms of labor laws. If you cannot work with your boss, if you be cannot, if you insubordinate your boss, if one person is to go, is the subordinate, not the boss. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to just close by addressing one issue, and it's Bear's address. Some Kenyans, hello, uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it is important to address this issue. Some Kenyans want us to divert attention from the impeachment that is before us. There's only one impeachment motion before us, and it's in respect of the deputy president. Now, some people have said, Kufa Makanga, Kufa the river. Now, let me explain to you. First of all, when you say Kufa the river, Kufa Makanga, you must remember that in that bus there are passengers. And those passengers can die if you are reckless. In this case, those passengers are Kenyans. We as parliament must navigate that issue so carefully that the passengers called Kenyans remain safe. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, that is extremely important. Why? We are in a very unique position where we have a president and a deputy president, but we do not have an IBC. If anything happens right now as we are going to, we, if we impeach the deputy president as we want to, as we need to, the position can be filled even without an IBC. But if there is no president and there is no deputy president, only the speaker can act for 60 days. Within those 60 days, there must be an election. We cannot currently have an election because we have no IBC. To have IBC commissioners, you need a president to nominate the, the board that will select them. Once the board is nominated and they propose a name, then the name must be forwarded again to us, and it's only the president who can nominate them. In other words, if you say Kufa Dereva, Kufa Makanga, you want absolute turmoil for all the Kenyans to die in that accident. That would be a very reckless act. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am convinced, having looked at the deputy president, having listened to him, that the deputy president is not remorseful. He is not sorry for any utterances. He is not prepared to change. He is a man who must be saved from himself by impeachment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I support. <laughs>